back Nurse Chung community to another video. In this video, we're going to cover topics that you're going to find on your anatomy and physiology concepts when it comes to the ATITs. So let's begin practicing so that we can reinforce knowledge as well as boost your test preparation. Let's get started. So let's start with our first question. Which of the following accurately describes the path of blood through the heart? Is it A, once the left ventricle is full, the left tricuspid valve shuts and the ventricle contracts and the blood exits through the aorta. B, once the right ventricle is full, blood exits into the pulmonary artery and then empties into the left ventricle. Is it C, blood enters the heart through the pulmonary vein into the right atrium and through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle? Or is it D, after traveling through the lungs, oxygenated blood enters into the left atrium, then through the mitral valve to the left ventricle? In order to understand what this question is asking, we overall have to understand the blood flow through the heart. So let's take a quick look at what happens there. So we have two main veins that brings all the blood from the body back to the heart. We have our inferior vena cava and we have our superior vena cava. That deoxygenated blood is going to come down through here into our right atrium. Then it's going to go through this little valve right here that's known as our tricuspid valve. Through the tricuspid valve, it's gonna enter in to our right ventricle, and then that blood is gonna go to our lungs via the pulmonary artery. Once the lungs have had some time to kind of oxygenate that blood, don't mess with my drawing, I know that I can't draw, <laughs> um, it's gonna come back through the pulmonary vein. Through the pulmonary vein, it's gonna enter in to our left atrium, through our bicuspid, it's also known as our mitral valve, down into our left ventricle, where it is gonna go up through our aortic valve to the aorta, which I'm just gonna write right here, out to the rest of the body. Back to our question, out of all of the answers that we have listed here, the only one that makes sense is answer D. After it travels to our lungs, that oxygenated lungs, remember they pick up oxygen in the lungs, it's gonna enter into our left atrium, that makes sense, it goes to the left side of our heart. Then it's gonna go through our mitral valve, also known as our bicuspid valve, whatever the test wants to call it, ultimately leading into the left ventricle. So the correct answer is D. Our next question, which of the following ions plays a crucial role in the depolarization phase of an action potential? Is it calcium, sodium, potassium, or chloride? So let's break this question down. So an ion is an atom or a molecule that has either gained or lost one or more electrons and is as a result either positively or negatively charged. An action potential is essentially an electrical signal that travels along nerve cells, also known as neurons, to our muscle cells. These signals are important for these cells to communicate with each other so that they can perform functions like moving our arm or sensing the heat outside. And then we have our depolarization phase. This is the action potential refers to the uh, specific part of the signal's journey. So normally inside our neuron, it's going to be more negatively charged than it is on the outside. Outside. This is known as its resting state. When the neuron receives a strong enough signal, it's going to trigger an action potential to take place. So during that depolarization phase, the inside of the neuron rapidly becomes more positive. This shift in charge helps to push the action potential along in the neuron. So the question is asking, which of the following ions plays a crucial role in the depolarization phase of an action potential. The question is really asking what kind of charged atom or ion is important in making the inside of the neuron more positive during that depolarization phase. The answer is going to be sodium. So if you look at sodium, sodium is written as Na plus, right? It's going to make it more positive on the inside. When the action potential begins, specialized channels in the neuron membrane open up, allowing those sodium ions to flow into that neuron. These sodium ions carry a positive charge with them, so their influx causes the inside of that neuron to become more positive, Thus, the depolarization of the cell occurs, allowing the action potential to propagate. Our next question, which of the following is the correct order of structures that air would pass through during inhalation? So is it A, nasal cavity, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli, B, 
larynx, pharynx, nasal cavity, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli. C, alveoli, bronchioles, bronchii, trachea, larynx, pharynx, and nasal cavity. Or D, bronchioles, bronchii, trachea, larynx, pharynx, nasal cavity, and alveoli. So in order to answer this question, again, we have to understand the structures that air is going to pass through when we breathe it in. So when we begin, when we breathe in, we're gonna breathe in through our nose and our mouth. Next, it's going to hit our pharynx. So the pharynx is the part of the throat that's directly behind the nose and the mouth, and the air is gonna move past the nose and the mouth into the pharynx, thus leading into our larynx. So our larynx is also known as our voice box. That's where all that sound comes from. It's located just behind the pharynx. The air is gonna move from the pharynx into the larynx. And then from there, it's going to go into our trachea. So our trachea is also known as our windpipe. That's that tube that carries the air from the larynx into our lungs. Once it gets into our lungs, it's going to break off into what? It's going to break off into our bronchi. The bronchi are those two tubes, right? They split off from the end of the trachea. Each are known as a bronchus. They're um, singular and they lead into the lungs themselves. Once we get into the bronchi, we have our bronchioles. And each bronchiole, again, they continue to branch off as we go deeper and deeper into the lungs. They're ultimately going to end in the alveoli. And the alveoli are those little tiny air sacs that are located at the end of each bronchial. They filled with oxygen, they help with a lot of gas exchange. That's kind of where the carbon dioxide that we exhale and the oxygen that we take in, that's where that gas exchange occurs is in those alveoli. So based on the answers that we have here, the correct answer is going to be A, right? It's gonna go through our nasal cavity. Next to that, right behind it is the pharynx. Connected to that is our larynx. Then we have our trachea. Then it branches into our bronchii, our left and our right, further branches into our bronchioles, and thus ending in our alveoli. Our next question. So this question is asking the hormone insulin is produced by which cell in the pancreas? Is it our alpha, beta, delta, or gamma cells? So we have to understand what each one of these are. So we start with alpha cells. When we think of alpha, we think of ascending. Ascending, specifically we're thinking of glucagon when it comes to our alpha cells. Glucagon for alpha cells makes sure that blood levels ascend or rise in the blood. So alpha cells produce glucagon. Glucagon ascends or raises our glucose levels. Next we have beta cells. And we think of beta cells, we think of beta brings it down. So this is where insulin is produced. So with insulin from our beta cells, that's going to bring our blood sugar levels down, ultimately helping our cells absorb that glucose and bringing the levels down. Next we have our delta. So when we think of delta cells, think of delta decreases. So what does delta cells decrease? So they actually produce something called somato Statin. So somatostatin is produced by delta cells which decrease or inhibit that release of insulin or glucagon, helping them keep things balanced. And then lastly, we have gamma cells. And when we think of gamma, think gamma guides. So gamma cells produce pancreatic polypeptides. And what these do is these actually help guide or regulate the activities of the pancreas themselves. So the question is asking, the hormone insulin is produced by which of the following cells in the pancreas? We know that the correct answer for this question is going to be B, because B is uh, beta cells, which is what produces our insulin. Our next question. All right, so the fight or flight response is mediated by the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. So our answers are sympathetic, parasympathetic, both or neither. So in order to answer this, we have to understand which each one of them do. So we start with our sympathetic. So we know with our sympathetic nervous system, this is our fight or flight response. And with that response, the system prepares your body for action, right? So it's gonna increase your heart rate, it's gonna dilate and widen your pupils and your airways to improve oxygen to flow into your muscles. It's gonna slow your digestion down because during fight or flight, we're not worried about you digesting, we're worried about keeping you alive. An easy way to remember this is that sympathetic is going to stress or speed up, both S words, stress, or speed up. Everything's gonna be on overdrive. And then next, we have our parasympathetic, right? That is our rest and digest. 
When we think of rest or digest or feed or breed, depending on how you learned it, the system is active during periods of rest and after eating, um, stimulating digestion, increasing our saliva production, and generally helping the body conserve energy and recover from activity. For the parasympathetic, an easy way that we are going to remember this is we are going to say peace or put on the brakes. We don't need to exert a whole bunch of energy when it comes to the parasympathetic system. We're not worried about that. So it's either gonna be peaceful, we're gonna be putting on the brakes. So the question asks, the fight or flight response is mediated by the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system? We've already answered our own question. The correct answer is going to be A, sympathetic, because that is our fight or flight response. Our next question is asking the pericardium is a double layered sac that contains the heart and the roots of which of the following? The great vessels, the bronchial tubes, the esophagus, or the vena cava. So that pericardium, as you know, is a thin two-layered sac that surrounds the heart. It's made up of two layers. It has an inner layer called the serous pericardium, which is in direct contact with the heart. And then you have your outer layer. That's the fibrous pericardium, which is that tougher, more rigid layer. The main function of the pericardium is to protect the heart and keep it in its position inside of the chest. So the question's asking, the pericardium is a double layered sac that contains the heart and the roots of the following. So we know it contains the heart, but what are those roots? So the roots in this question refer to the places where vessels connect to the heart. The pericardium surround not only the heart, but also surrounds the roots of the great vessels that connect to the heart. So we can automatically eliminate B and we can eliminate C because both of those have nothing to do with the cardiovascular system. That is our respiratory system. So we have the vena cava and the great vessels. So while, yeah, the vena cava, we can have the inferior and superior vena cava, they are part of that system. The great vessels is actually more correct, right? Because it's including all of those vessels that come off the heart, not just a specific one. So the correct answer for this question is going to be A, the great vessels. Our next question is asking which part of the brain is primarily responsible for voluntary motor control? Is it cerebellum, medulla oblongata, frontal lobe or parietal lobe. So let's break each one of these down so that we can tell what each one does, right? So with cerebellum, we're thinking CB. We're thinking coordination and we're also thinking balance. So the cerebellum is responsible for coordinating voluntary movements. That's a key word, voluntary. Coordinating those voluntary movements like posture, balance, coordination, as well as speech, resulting in smooth and balanced muscular activity. When we think of medulla, we think of mandatory. The medulla controls many of the mandatory or automatic functions of the body, such as breathing, heart rate, as well as our blood pressure. Next, we have the frontal lobe. So when we think of this, we think of frontline commander. So what does our frontline commander do? Like a commander, it's gonna make decisions and it's gonna issue commands that control the movements in groups. The frontal lobe is responsible for voluntary movement. It sends the orders to your muscles to perform certain actions like lifting a glass or waving hello. And this is done through a specific area in the frontal lobe called the motor cortex. Next, we have the parietal lobe. and that parietal lobe, we think of perception and position. So the parietal lobe processes sensory information, right? We got a lot of sensory information taking place here because it receives from the outside world, particularly relating to our senses, touch, taste, as well as spatial positioning. And this ultimately helps us understand where our body is in space in order to navigate our environment. So the question is asking, what part of the brain is primarily responsible for voluntary motor control? What part of that brain is primarily responsible? That's your big key word here. And the one that's really doing all the work, even though the cerebellum does help, the one that's doing all of that work is actually our frontal lobe, our frontline commander is the part of the brain that's responsible for voluntary motor control. Our next question. So the filtration unit of a kidney known as the nephron does not include which of the following structures? Is it A, Bowman's capsule, B, loop of Henle, C, glomerulus, or D, gallbladder? So this is another good one that's gonna be on the test. It's just gonna kind of be process of elimination. So as you're looking through, you're gonna kind of do your check marks. So does the Bowman's capsule exists within the urinary system. Yes, absolutely. Does the loop of Henle? 
Yes, it does. It is definitely in there. We do have glomeruluses inside of our kidneys, but now we have gallbladder. This is a completely different organ that is not part of our renal system, right? It's not part of the kidney. It's not part of the nephron. It has nothing to do with any of that. So by process of elimination, when you're looking at these types of questions, look and see what actually exists within the systems that it's asking about. And if something seems out of place, that's most likely going to be the correct or incorrect answer, depending on what it's asking. Our next question is asking the period of the cardiac cycle during which the ventricles are filling with blood is known as what? Is it diastole, systole, repolarization, or ejection phase? So let's break each one of these down. So with diastole, when you're thinking of this, think of dilation. So dilation, specifically during diastole, the heart's ventricles are relaxed and they dilate to expand to fill with blood. This is when the heart is in a state of relaxation and the blood pressure is at its lowest. Next we have systole, right? When you think of systole, think squeeze. This is that contraction phase that we see um, with our systole versus our diastole. The ventricles are going to contract or squeeze and pump that blood out of the heart into either the body or into the lungs. And this is when our blood pressure is ultimately at its highest. Next we have repolarization. When you think of repolarization, think of reset. This is what's happening in the heart. After the heart muscle cells or the myocytes contract, they need time to reset their electrical state in order to be ready for the next contraction. This resetting process is known as repolarization. And then lastly, we have the ejection phase. So this is part of systole when the blood is actively being pumped out of the heart. So when you think of the injection phase, think of exit right? We have blood exiting the heart. Like I said, this is the ejection phase. This is when the blood is exiting the heart. So what is going to be the correct answer? What is the question asking? It's the period of that cardiac cycle, which the ventricles are filling with blood. So that period of time when those ventricles are filling with blood has to be during that relaxation time, right? And we are going to find that in a diastole. Diastole, remember dilation equals to relaxation, allowing the heart to refill with blood. And now we've come to our last question, our last practice question. So it's asking the semicircular canals found in the inner ear are primarily responsible for which of the following? Is it hearing, balance and spatial orientation, smell or taste? So when we look at the inner ear, that's the innermost part of the ear that's involved with both hearing as well as balance. That inner ear contains several structures, including the cochlea, which is primarily involved in hearing, as well as the vestibular system that's involved in balance. Our semicircular canals are those three little tiny fluid-filled tubes located on the inner ear that's also part of that vestibular system, which as we know is part of uh, balance. They're going to be arranged roughly at right angles of each ear, and each one is going to be positioned to detect a certain type of movement, whether we're moving up and down, left and right, or we're tilting from side to side. So the question's asking, the semicircular canals found in the inner ear are primarily responsible for which of the following? Well, as we know, based on what each part of that inner ear does, we can say that the correct answer is going to be B, balance and spatial orientation. I hope that this video was helpful in strengthening your understanding of key anatomy and physiology concepts when it comes to the ATITs. Remember, thorough preparation is key in achieving success on this test. Keep practicing, stay confident, and you'll be well prepared to tackle this section. Best of luck on your ATITs, and as always, I'll see you in the next video. Bye!